Aloha awina la. This is Hawaii is my mainland, and I'm Kaui Lucas. Archaeoastronomy is the study of how people in the past have understood sky phenomena, ways they've used these phenomena, and what role the heavens played in their cultures. Archaeoastronomy studies the symbolically rich cultural interpretations of sky phenomena, not just the numbers and, and lines. Today, Martha Noyes is my guest to talk about Hawaiian archaeoastronomy at Kukani Loko, a site in central Oahu, as a way of setting the context for understanding current events like the controversy over building the 30-meter telescope on Mauna Kea, for instance. While a deep understanding of Hawaiian cosmogony is not really doable in 20 minutes, we can grasp the foundation. Aloha kawa, Martha. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. So, um, you, this has been um, a 12-year journey of exploration and discovery. It's been the most astonishing experience I've ever had. Uh, obviously, I'm not young. I've had many teachers over the years. Never have I had as amazing a teacher as Kukani Loko. Okay, well tell us a little, just a little, a little bit about um, how you started there. Yes, and well. Then, and then we'll talk about why it's so important. Okay. I knew only a little about Kukani Loko. I knew what everybody knows, where it is, that it was the royal birthing site, that it was famous, and that it mattered. I also did know that it was a Kane tradition site, which meant it had a relationship with the sun. I quickly learned that it had a relationship to the sunrise and sunset at the equinoxes. There were specific places in the landscape, Ka'aumokua and Mauna Ka'ala, where the sun rose or set on the two equinoxes. But that was about it. And, and how did you know that? Um, just, we'll just take this one specific and sure. to, to kind of tie it into the landscape. Okay, so. That was somewhat general knowledge among people closely tied to Kukani Loko, like um, Tom Lenchenko, of course, and his sister, Jolyn Kalimapal. Also, my nephew, Mahia Keale, or Keale Kupuna, um, and some others. So it was knowledge that's been passed down, people know that... And it's knowledge that is visually recreatable, or observable every year, provided that the Koalaos have some, don't have cloud cover, <laughs> but they usually do. But still, you can always see the sun set over Ka'ala. Okay. So, on the, on, so people knew that on the equinoxes that, that if you were at Kukani Loko, that's where it was. Exactly. Okay. And somehow there was a, um, also an orientation at Kukani Loko? Yes, I didn't know that right away, but once I had asked some kupuna if they thought it would be okay or worthwhile for me to start investigating the astronomy there, and they said yes, that was one of the first things I saw. I had a map, a survey map or a site plan that archaeologists had done showing the layout of the stones. And looking at that, I, whoa, I can see that it's aiming at the northern, northwest, the setting of the June solstice sun. I checked it further, and sure enough, the site at one end aims at the December solstice sunrise at Pu'ukamana, and on the other end to the June solstice sunset over Kamana Nui. And Kamana Nui is, um, is a, right there at that, there's an area there around Kukani Loko, which is called Kamana Nui. Yes, but so you're it, it, no, it, it's closer to... Kaena, so it passes over there. Um, there are more landscape markers closer even than that, but it was an interesting com juxtaposition of Komana for December and Komana Nui for June 
indicating a probable mm. relationship of importance. So you were studying the, the Hawaiian names of heavenly bodies and traditions um, associated with them. Yes. And, and then somehow um, tying that into what you saw on the ground. And we have, a, we have, a, we have that site map or a site map that is um, a little rough, but you know, we get the idea and that'll pop up here. Yeah, so this map has is corrected for magnetic north, which means it's slightly off north-south, slightly off east-west. But basically, a line going across from the far right to the far left at the center of the site crosses through the pico stone and the birth stone. So it connects those two stones to one another. And in the, and in the um, image behind us, we see those stones. Yes. The pico stone is the stone with the serrations. Okay. Mm -hmm. And behind you is the uh, birthstone. Okay. Way over there. There you go. There, there we go. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and they are in an east-west rela relationship. So extending that relationship to Pu'uka'aumakua, and the equinox sunrise goes through those two stones and all the way over to Mauna Ka'ala at the western or 270 degrees away. Uh, so this is, this is a big deal because the west is origin. That's the region of Hawaiian origins. It's the region of ancestry. It, and that makes it the reason, region of lineage of genealogy, which comes into play with the stars. And with birth. Pardon? And with birth. And with, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yes, the child born at that stone inherits all of that that is represented in that east-west line. So as we were trying to, um, having our little discussion prior to this and found ourselves, um, uh, hopping between different um, different disciplines in the Western sense, um, <clears throat> it was uh, such a, a good reminder of how our, our our training has shaped the ways in which we think, and um, so the exploration of of um, phenomena um, and tying it into cultural practices as well as understanding in a completely different system. Um, can you talk about that? Yes. It was fascinating. It was exciting. It is still fascinating and still exciting to understand what I was seeing. I mean, I had data, but data to me, it didn't, what was it without context? But in order to understand context, I had to spend time trying to understand what a dog meant in pre-contact Hawaii. What was it symbolically? What was it literally? Um, flowers, lays, piercing. What did that mean to pierce? Connecting. What did that mean to be connected? What was an opposite? What was a union? All of these things. What was a female deity and how was she unlike a male deity and vice versa? There wasn't anything that wasn't involved, cordage. I had to learn about the twisting of bits of cord to make cordage, about canoes. It was all part of what we would call archaeoastronomy or cultural astronomy. You can't take one apart. You can't take one strand out of the weaving and still have a mat. And so when people talk about uh, the Native Hawaiian religion, for instance, that's a very difficult concept to, um, to cut off from the other kinds of understanding as you've just explained, right? Because it's, it was not separate. 
it's not divisible. If Haumea is the star Aldebaran, and she is a goddess of birth, she is the wife of many, the mother of many, she is also Papa. Papa took the name Haumea when she left Wakea. She is also associated with the breadfruit tree, but a specific kind of breadfruit tree, the low-growing, spreading breadfruit tree. How do you make that religion and not science or not medicine or not astronomy? And then if you name the landscape for her, how do you make it not geography? It's a conundrum. <laughs> it is indeed. <laughs> uh, Western science has been doing its utmost for the last couple hundred years, however. Yeah, yes, and, and it's... <laughs> and it's taught us, many of us, well. It has, and then we have to go and teach ourselves. <laughs> right, right. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's basically what, what you've been doing. So um, we, um, we're going to take a break in a, in a minute, and mm -hmm. then when we come back, I... I'm wanting you to, to explain how some of these systems arise from the land and are translated to um, broader contexts mm -hmm. of understanding. Okay, sure. Thanks, we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Cheryl Crozier Garcia. I'm the host of Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii. It's a program where we discuss the impact of change on workers, employers, and the economy. So join us every other Tuesday from 4 o'clock to 4.30. We're live in the studio on Working Together in Think Tech Hawaii. Take care, see you soon. Bye. Aloha, I'm State Senator Russell Ruderman. I represent the Puna and Ka'u District on the Big Island and the host of Ruderman Roundtable. We're here on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. You can join us at thinktechhawaii.com. You can find a link there to, uh, to a page where you can see past episodes. And we talk here about good government, environmental issues, and issues of the day facing the state of Hawaii. I'm Russell Ruderman. Please join us for the Ruderman Roundtable. Mahalo. Aloha, welcome back to Hawaii is my mainland. I'm Kaui Lucas. And with me today is Martha Noyes, and we are talking about Kukani Loco, and we are talking about um, the intersection of um, culture and science, um, to put it in Western terms. Um, but just life, <laughs> it, the way life was lived in, in pre-contact Hawaii, and using the overall umbrella term of archaeoastronomy, <laughs> So Kukani Loko, the birthing stones in, in, in near Wahiwa in central Oahu, where you have spent a great deal of time um, and, and just really deep research. So help us learn some of the, the systemic lessons of working in a place like that, that is so heavily layered with meanings and uh, lessons. Yes. Um. Kukani Loko is a very special place, obviously. And sometimes I would go out there armed with instruments, Western science data stuff, to, and I'd get out there and I'd go, oh, I don't want to. And I'd just kind of walk, and then I'd go sit down, and I wouldn't use my instruments, and I'd be there for 15 minutes or an hour, or longer, and I wouldn't do anything except be there. And then I'd go home, and I'd think, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then, all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, I would understand something that I didn't know I needed to know. And I would jump out of bed and go to my computer and fire up maps and planetarium software, and I'd go, Oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> um, one of those events was learning that the mountains, some of the mountains in the Waianae Range, which is west of Kukaniloko, 
were named for stars, not because the stars set there, but because of the evening that the stars rose, the sun set there. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that was my reaction, like, oh, ah, you know, wow. So this is one of the bits of data that says the sky experts or the star experts really, really understood the relationships among celestial bodies. They knew that if the sun was here, this star was there. They knew where the architecture of the sky was at all times. This is something we don't, we don't continue to have those relationships in our mind. If Orion is there, Taurus or Aldebaran is here, and if they're there and there, the sun is where? We don't know, but they knew. And let's talk about some of the rock form formations too. We have a couple other uh, pictures of the of uh, Kukani Loco, and we can so for instance this one. Mm. Kukani Loco has two. Uh, excuse me, the Pico Stone at Kukani Loco has two of these concentric circles on it. One on the southern side of the widest part of the stone and one on the northern side of the widest part of the stone. This one's on the southern side. You can see a pico there in that set of concentric circles, that little gouge in the center. The northern set of circles also has one. If you were to draw a line between those two central pukas, that line would be exactly true north to true south. Yeah, not from Polaris to the Southern Cross, because that misses true north and south, but exactly true north and true south. That again is not something they did casually. They knew what they were doing. It's a little bit more than that though. <laughs> the northern set of concentric circles above the widest point. The widest point represents the Earth Earth's equator. This northern set, its puka, is 20 degrees north of the line of the equator on that stone. We, Oahu, are 21 degrees north. I don't think that was an error. <laughs> no, and you, somehow there is a, also a way of um, locating on the island places uh, through the stones? Well, yes, um, astronomically through the stones because landscape markers, places on the landscape where the stars rise or set are named for the stars. But not, they're named for all of the stars that the months are named for. But they're also named for Dube of the Big Dipper and for the Southern Cross and for some other stars that are not as well known as the calendar stars. So knowing where those stars are tells you where the landscape is, a landscape marker is. Knowing where the landscape marker is tells you its relationship to Kukani Loco. And explain um, how you came to see it as a, as a way of recording knowledge. Because the landscape is named for the rise and set of stars. And it's named that way in such specificity that you know which star they're speaking of. And because the stars each have many names and those names all mean something, that information together is a library or at least an encyclopedia. <laughs> It tells us of the stars' functions within the culture. It tells can, us... Can you give us an example? Yeah, sure. Aldebaran, Haumea, and Antares, Lehua, who both have many other names, um, are two of the main stars involved in the structure and space of space and time. They do this by building a house. 
a celestial house. Antares is the pillar in front. Aldebaran is the pillar in back. They're equally important because even if he's the pillar in front, a single pillar isn't very good at holding up a roof beam. So it takes the pillar in back to partner to hold up the roof beam. So they structure time and space through these relationships that they have. One of the names for Antares actually says that. One of his names is Ikuwa, the lord of space and time. And in your book of star names, um, well, it's the catalog of them. It's not really star names. <coughs> Um, <clears throat> can you tell us about um, what, uh, how that came and... Yes. I knew that Hawaiian stars had many names. The Pleiades aren't just Makali'i. They have other names. You know, we, we tend to have learned only one name for those few stars we know. And is that, um, is the many names, is that because in different places in Hawaii had different names for the same stars or... Mm, that, that may play into it, I don't know, but it certainly is the case that star names referred to their functions. So if your function was fishing, calling a star kaul pai, shrimp catching season, <laughs> um, meant one thing. Okay. But if you were a navigator and it was hokukelewa'a, the I navigation star. Okay. It, okay. So, and then there's much more esoteric material going on at the same time. Um, so, so that um, the, the knowledge of the function of that star might be specific <coughs> to one's um, uh, profession. Pr profession. Yeah. Right. And so um, talk a little bit about who would know what and, and how that relates to Kukani Loko. Not, uh, just about everybody would know Moon the nights of the moon. They would know the months, the seasons, um, and the season breaks, which are very close to when the Pleiades rise, very associated with the Pleiades. They may know Venus because it's so bright. Um, they may know other things. Other more specific profession-related things were, re were not necessarily restricted, but at the higher levels of knowledge, restricted to the profession. And the greatly esoteric knowledge would have been restricted to the priestly astrologers, sky experts, the other sorts of grand intellects that would have managed this kind of knowledge. So at Kukani Loko, was there a heo uh, associated with it, or is it absolutely, you know, kind of its I'm own... I'm not sure hell is the word that okay. fits what was going on there. No, that doesn't but seem temple, to be. temple, okay. um, maybe. Um, there was certainly, beyond the birth, addition to the birthing site, Kukani Loko was a Pu'oho Nua. And as a Pu'oho Nua, that means that not everybody who was in the vicinity was royal. Because not everybody who needed to go to a Pu'oho Nua and could go, or got there, was royal. So there probably was some sharing of, even if it, it was inadvertent, knowledge. But also, Kukani Loko seems to have functioned as a college, as a university. The way the site is laid out and the way the stones are set up for multiple purposes, uh, the Pico Stone for locating Kukani Loko, for locating the stars in relation to, to Kukani Loko, for measuring in 10 day seg segments the passage of the sun throughout the year, and on and on. This seems to have been educational. Wow, okay, so in, in, our, in our last two minutes, um, th thank you, uh, by the way, for um, uh, g giving us a, a a broad stroke um, look at, and I think anybody w watching will understand that there are <clears throat> infinite layers of meanings to everything. And I am profoundly grateful for you for 
simplifying it to a point where it's there is something to be taken from this and yet appreciating that there is you're you, you're very much just skimming the surface um, so you mentioned um, about about your book um, that um, if people are interested there might be some way to find it yes if you want to own a hard copy you can get it at amazon.com or at native books but I put it on academia.edu as a PDF free download so ah. I'm, I'm, I'm not doing it for money <laughs> Well, there's nothing bad about that, nope. um, but um, but thank you for making it uh, for making it so widely available. Um, that's really a great service. I so want people to be excited by this kind of work and to engage in it themselves. So, um, in our, in our last minute, what what do you think um, for you is the most important thing moving forward in your relationship with this work? Sharing it, giving it away showing people how to do it. Um, how, do, how does one do it? Um, the doing of it is, the, the physical doing of it, the data gathering is very easy. It takes a few tools. Um, your cell phone can help you. Interpreting the data is a little more taxing, but it's also where the ecstasy, the realization, the recognition, the understanding of what an immense kind of knowledge reservoir was here is. So to those people on uh, TripAdvisor who said, uh, not much there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to post a link to this show. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Martha. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha.